This is one of those noisy but wonderful machines which were the power behind the Industrial Revolution, a steam engine. Until about the beginning of the 18th century, all that man had to help him with his work, apart from his horse and perhaps his wife, were the power from wind and moving water. And with the development of the steam engine, man discovered how to use a new form of energy, heat, the heat which is derived from the combustion of fuels. This wasn't entirely a new idea. As early as the first century AD, Hero developed this little device in which he used heat to convert water into steam and then used the steam to turn a turbine. To Hero, this was little more than a toy. He doesn't seem to have had the idea of using this to do useful work for him, probably because the Greeks had plenty of human slaves. Today, our work is almost entirely done by mechanical slaves, and these are usually heat engines, not just the steam engine, which was the first, but other familiar kinds of heat engines, such as the internal combustion engine in our motor cars, the rocket, the jet engine, and even the atomic power station, which uses nuclear fuel instead of chemical fuel. All of these are heat engines. They're devices for converting the energy of heat into useful work. For the first hundred years of steam engines, the principles on which they worked were hardly understood at all. What exactly happens when the heat of a furnace is turned into the rotation of a wheel? And what are the uh, theoretical efficiencies of uh, such a process and an engine which carries it out? The science which gave the answers to these questions was called thermodynamics, because it deals with the relation between thermal effects, heat, and dynamic effects. It's been said that science owes more to the steam engine than the steam engine owes to science because it's turned out that thermodynamics is a far wider application than the engineers who first developed it can ever have imagined. It has also been said that we should all appreciate thermodynamics and the second law in particular rather as we appreciate Beethoven and Shakespeare as part of our general culture. This is not so that we can all build bigger and better steam engines, but because the science of thermodynamics is one of the great achievements of man. It, it's an idea of great significance and beauty, and one with wide philosophical implications. Unfortunately, most people find thermodynamics more difficult to understand than Beethoven and Shakespeare. But this, I think, is because they start with the steam engine and then have to go through the tortuous historical development of the subject. Today, we understand the basis of thermodynamics, the fundamentals, are very much better, and this has made the whole thing very much easier to understand. There are really only two basic laws, and the first of these is familiar to everyone who pay pays a fuel bill. It's just the law of conservation of energy. It says that energy can't be created, it can't be destroyed. It tells us that in an engine like this, if we convert the energy of our fuel into the energy of work, of rotation of the wheel, then we must do so uh, according to a strict rate of exchange. It tells us how much work we can get from how much fuel. But the first law does not tell us whether we can exchange our energy in this way, whether it's possible. The law which tells us whether this is possible is the second law of thermodynamics. And the answer which this law gives is a categorical no. The second law of thermodynamics is the law of disorder, the law of increasing entropy. And it tells us that in any spontaneous process, of which a heat engine is just one example, the disorder must always increase. Let's make our engine do a little work for us and see how this applies. I'll couple to it a heavy sack of flour and we'll start the engine and let it raise this sack of flour. There it goes, quite comfortably raising this heavy weight. And what is it doing as this process occurs? It's converting the energy of the fuel into the uh, moving energy of that sack. But these are different kinds of energy. 
If this is a bit of our fuel, you know, as it becomes hot, the atoms in it move, they acquire kinetic energy, but it's a random energy, a disordered energy of motion of heat. Now that sort of energy somehow in this steam engine becomes converted into the kinetic energy of a different kind, the energy of the sac moving upwards. And this is ordered energy. You see, the molecules are all moving in the same way. And so this engine is somehow managing to turn disordered kinetic energy of heat into ordered motion of work. This is what the second law of thermodynamics tells us is not entirely possible. One can't convert disordered motion into ordered motion completely. Let's have a look at the second law of thermodynamics, a statement of it, in a little more detail. Here it is. It says that every system, if left to itself, will on the average change to a condition of maximum probability. And so, whenever a change is occurring, the probability is continually increasing. The probability is determined by the number of possible arrangements, and it's a measure of the disorder of the system. We give the probability the symbol P, and we find it useful very often to use, instead of P, the logarithm of P, or K log P, the log uh, multiplied by a constant. K log P is what we call the entropy, and we give the entropy the symbol S. Now clearly, if the probability increases, the entropy must increase. And so we can express the second law in another way, in terms of entropy, in this way. In any spontaneous process, the total entropy increases, and total tells us that we must take everything into account, everything which is changing. So here we have two ways of expressing the second law. And there are other ways, but these will do us for the moment. And let's now see how the second law works by looking at a number of spontaneous changes. The simplest are those where there's no exchange of energy with the surroundings so that we can see the change of entropy all by itself. One of these is the expansion of a gas into a vacuum. This is bromine gas, this is a vacuum, and if I connect the two, the bromine rushes from one to the other and fills the whole volume. And there are no heat changes and no temperature changes in a perfect gas uh, expansion of this kind. Only entropy. Another case which is mainly an entropy change, very often completely an entropy change, if there is no exchange of energy with the surroundings again, is the mixing of two liquids. They mix spontaneously and never unmix. A rather different kind of change is the exchange of heat between two bodies. If I take a red-hot poker from this furnace and plunge it into cold water, the Heat is transferred from the poker to the water. The poker becomes colder, the water becomes hotter. Of course, heat travels from a hot to a cold body. A familiar enough experience. And it doesn't matter how the transfer has occurred. Thermodynamics has nothing to say about mechanism. It always t only tells us about the direction of things. So that I can transfer the heat by radiation equally well. Here I have a red-hot iron ball which I'm going to transfer, I'm going to place at the focus of this mirror. So. Now that's a hot body, if ever there was one. And here, at the focus of the second mirror, is a cold body. Between them is a screen stopping the radiation. And if you look at the cold body as I remove the screen, we shall see the result of heat transfer from there to the cold body, from the hot body to the cold body. You see it's beginning to smoke. The heat is clearly being transferred from hot to cold and eventually it bursts into flame. Now, let's consider what happens in this process and particularly what the entropy changes are. <coughs> we'll call the temperature of the hot body T hot and the temperature of the cold body T cold. 
and we'll transfer a little heat, Q, from the hot body to the cold body. Now, when the cold body absorbs heat, Q, its temperature, its entropy increases by Q over T cold. And we'll complete the equation and say delta S is equal to that. Similarly, when the hot body loses heat, Q, it decreases its entropy by Q over T hot. So it increases it by minus Q over T hot. And the total increase in entropy is Q over T cold minus Q over T hot. Now T cold is less than T hot. So Q over T cold is greater than Q over T hot. So this is positive and the entropy increases as it must according to the second law of thermodynamics. If you try to make heat pass from a cold to a warm body, the entropy will decrease, and that's not possible. In fact, one of the earliest statements of the second law of thermodynamics was that heat cannot of itself pass from a cold to a warmer body. Now let's have a look at some other spontaneous changes. I'm going to mix another two colored liquids. Oh dear, they haven't mixed. And what's more, they spontaneously unmix. Entropy seems to be decreasing. Order is increasing spontaneously. Has something gone wrong with the second law? Let's have a look at another system. Into this dish, I'm going to pour some hypo, a strong solution of hypo. And watch what happens in the dish. Now you see, right away, crystals are growing spontaneously. And a crystal is one of the most beautifully ordered things in nature. Beautiful rows, layers of ordered atoms are arising from the disordered solution which we had. Again, order from disorder spontaneously. The clue to what's happening is given if I feel this, it's warm. Heat is being given out to the surroundings. Now, when we stated the second law, we said that in every spontaneous process, the total entropy increases. And I carefully underline total and stress this, because we must take into account everything concerned in the change, the whole universe, if necessary. And we must take into account, therefore, the surroundings. Let's call the hypo the object. And the increase in entropy of the object, delta S object. Now this block can represent the surroundings, and at the moment it's cold. Here are the molecules blue with cold, you see. The reaction proceeds, gives out heat to the block, the block heats up, and immediately disorder is created in the block, in the surroundings. And in fact, the entropy of the surroundings increases by delta S surroundings which of course is Q over T, where Q is the heat given to the surroundings. So it's the sum of the two entropies, delta S object and delta S surroundings, which we must take into account, and that we can call the whole universe, at least every part of the universe which takes part in the change, and let that represent the universe. Everything going on is inside this closed system, and it's the entropy changes in there which must be positive. It's useful to make a balance sheet of our entropy changes. Here we are, we will put the entropy change in the object, in the surroundings, and the sum of those will be the total entropy change in everything, in the universe if necessary. Now the simplest first cases which we studied of mixing and expansion without exchange of energy with the surroundings had an increase in energy of the object, in entropy of the object, the entropy increase was positive. There was no change in the surroundings, no heat was given out, and so naturally the entropy of the universe increased, which is all right. In these peculiar processes, the unmixing and the crystallization, there was an exchange of energy with the surroundings. So that although the entropy decreased, the entropy of the object decreased, the heat given out to the surroundings caused the surroundings entropy to increase. 
And the sum of those caused an increase in entropy of the universe, which we must have. At least the universe must not decrease its entropy. It can have a very small or even zero increase, but it mustn't decrease. So this is fine. There is an entropy increase if we take everything into account. In this uh, column here, I've put polymerization, which is the building up of big molecules from small ones. And I've also put the evolution of life. This is the problem of the chicken and the egg. Here is the chicken and his original home. And here is what he started from, the mixed up goo of an egg, a, a disordered sort of system, whereas the chicken is beautifully ordered. Spontaneously, in the hatching process, the chicken, the order of the chicken, grew out of the disorder of the egg. But again, although the entropy of the object decreased in this process, the entropy of the surroundings increased because during the incubation period, the egg is giving out heat. So this also fits in nicely to our scheme. Now we can have other combinations. One is the burning of a fuel. A fuel like this cellulose nitrate will change and increase its entropy. And in this case, it will increase the entropy of the surroundings as well. Clearly, the molecules of the cellulose nitrate are now very disordered, floating around. So the entropy of the object has increased. But because of the heat given out to the surroundings, the entropy of the surroundings has increased. And the sum of those, of course, means that the entropy of the universe has increased. Another different one, again, is that where the entropy of the surroundings decreases. This happens if the object absorbs heat from the surroundings. Here is a case where this happens. Uh, some ammonium nitrate into which I pour a little water to make a solution. And if I put the thermometer in, the mercury goes rocketing down, down from 25 to 10, and eventually down uh, below naught. It's cooled, and therefore heat is being absorbed from the surroundings in this case. And that means <coughs> that the entropy of the surroundings in this case decreases. As the solution process takes place, the entropy of the object increases, and it's possible again for the entropy of the universe to increase. Finally, there are mechanical objects. And in most cases, here, the entropy change of the object is zero. Because entropy doesn't change with position. If we have a falling weight like this, the entropy doesn't depend on the position of the weight. Even if it acquires motion as it falls under gravity, the, the motion is an ordered motion. The molecules are moving like this, and if they bounce, they're still ordered, moving in the other direction. But of course, mechanical objects run down, and they do it by converting their ordered motion into the disordered motion of heat, uh, which is passed to the surroundings. And so the entropy of the surroundings in such mechanical changes increases. We normally think of mechanical changes as ones where the energy decreases. This is because heat is given out to the surroundings, which increases the entropy. And so again, the entropy of the universe increases. The only combination we haven't had now is two minuses. And this would mean a minus, a decrease in entropy of the universe, which is impossible. One might ask, why is it that entropy always increases with time? Science can't answer why, it answers how. And the only answer it could give to that question would be that entropy increases with time because time goes forwards, and this doesn't sound terribly helpful. In fact, it's an interesting statement because the increase of entropy with time is one of the few ways we have about telling the direction of time. Unfortunately, the second law of thermodynamics prevents me from doing an experiment where time goes backwards. The best we can do is to make time stand still by using an apparatus in which there are no entropy changes, a mechanical apparatus like this swing. Providing the swing is reasonably free of uh, friction, 
there will be no changes when I stop talking which enable you to say whether time is going forwards or backwards. Well, some entropy changes seem to have crept in after all. And what's more, they were entropy decreases, which immediately told us that time had been reversed. But of course, that can only happen in the fantasy world of the film. In our real world, time moves forwards always in the direction of increasing entropy. And we're ruled inexorably by the arrow of time, the second law of thermodynamics.